Okay, so welcome to your studio. Well, that's sick. This is, uh, this is what I'm calling not having fun, and this is the second episode of this. <laughs> so this is what I remember your studio kind of looking like. Oh, you got the concrete texture. That's cool. Yeah, I got your drawing tier, too. <laughs> and uh, not a commentary on your studio at all, but I decided I, was, I added a pig pen here. <laughs> I oh, know that looks just like Chip. Yeah. This is the new series, what you're calling the minimum wage series. Yeah, that's the minimum wage series. Do you want to give like a little intro about these just, just for just for context purposes? Yeah, sure. So I made all of these eight and a half by eleven panels last year. First it was with the in uh, intention of like making a panel that was the exact size of a computer paper printout because that's all I had for uh, image transfers, but I wanted to make a body of work that every, every day people could buy. Like we always talk about this. We're always complaining about capitalism and elitism and the exclusion of the art world and how who can never own anything. And I was all constantly upset about it. Like I can't afford art. Why would I expect anyone else to be able to buy my work at three thousand dollars a painting? That's right. crazy. And so I made all of these eight and a half by eleven inch pieces. Um, the concept is specifically what has to do with minimum wage is that they're all the price of an eight hour shift at minimum wage in the state or place that you're in. So like in New York state, minimum wage is $15 an hour. So each of these paintings is uh, in New York state would cost $120 because that's how much money you make in one eight hour shift at $15 an hour. I wanted to tie the painting specifically to the minimum wage to highlight how terrible it is and also make it literally affordable uh and then the work itself like the content there's a lot of like guttural abstraction which was like me being frustrated there is me taking all of the imagery i've saved over the years and just directly transferring them like not even mediate not even mediating them like not trying to filter them just putting them down which is a lot of stuff related back to like the absurdity of american culture or absurdity of work the ridiculousness of capitalism a lot of the times you know these spaces like right there's like i think that's actually your casino photo that's a guy robbing a store yeah <laughs> that's just a bunch of yeah. work i took a photo of you know there's like there's this huge like array of imagery in it that kind of ties back to like i mean i was specifically like really thinking about um capitalist alienation like when you don't have access to the economy in a capitalist society you become alienated and therefore you become mad or you become a criminal. And so a lot of this has to do with madness and criminality that is the result of being alienated from a society that you don't have access to because you don't have capital. And so taking that imagery, taking that idea, taking those feelings, you know, me being someone who worked for minimum wage for years of my life and putting that into the work and then also making the work literally cost the rate of minimum wage. So that's the idea of the work. Okay, great. Technically uh, speaking, these kind of depart from your, or they're in, they're in line, but there's also a sort of departure from your old work where it involved basically a, a a abstract and textured background, and then you have an image transfer on top of that. And then you have some more technique going in with, uh, with the treatment of the image. So yeah, these kind so of embodied. These are different. So actually, if you pan to the right to see some of the other ones too, um, I well, actually, you know, I got like a lot of feedback from like you and McFadden and Chip and other people. And one of the things everyone kept telling me that they thought would be a good, de good departure, as you said, is just like, what if I just do the transfer? That's it. What if I didn't mediate it? What if I didn't edit it or obscure it? Like, so you can see like some of them, some of those pieces, it's just a transfer of something that's happening. And I haven't done anything candidly. I haven't added anything to it at all. It's some of it is incredibly abstracted and mutilated and broken and almost like unrecognizable. Um, but yeah, like one of the big departures is that like a lot of the time I do representational or semi-representational painting. Like I still like paint images and places and people or, or objects, but these are, these are objects in and of themselves. Not a lot of them are actually like, you know, there's no like Trump lawyer aspect. There's no like representation. There's no like, traditional art making going on in these and these were meant to be like really guttural and really 
reactive and non thought out. I just wanted to kind of take everything I've been thinking about and all my my material, my reference photos, and just dump them. I so like it's like these happen really quick, and I don't really think about it, and I slap things together. Um, so it actually is a huge departure because a lot of time I do like slower, like considered image making. Like I kind of in some ways still like a pretty traditional painter. That's uh, that was definitely one of the questions I had um, in mind when I was going through each uh, image that you submitted. It was like they start. It seems like they like started off very kind of like uh, here's an image transfer along with some other with some technique onto it, and then they started getting I think a little bit more abstract, and they started getting more like like hiding the image or obscuring the image, and then there was a a reversion back to uh, just depicting the trans or just having the transfer. And um, I was going to ask about that, but you since but you answered that very nicely. I think like oh cool. I think like this one, this one I was looking into this one over here. I was looking into this oh, one. Pop-tarts. Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize it was pop tarts, but still, like it dawned on me that it was not just an abstract texture, but it was also but it was actually this very like recognizable. Um, it sits in the middle of those two things. Yeah, I kind of like that. Like, if you get real close, you're like, oh, I recognize this. But far away, it's like, what the, I don't know what I'm looking at. I think there's this really, um, but I like the, I like the idea that you, like, just thinking about the concept, you have these image, you, you have these pieces, which are just literally a, a image transfer of like a gas station robbery. And you're putting it on a canvas without like a, without like this kind of zhuzh about, about making an artwork an artwork. It's very much a, it's very like, like, here's the image what I found, I think there's like this like nice network that's being built up of, of, of uh, symbols where it's like you have the image, you have what the image represents, which is, as you said, this very shitty form of capitalism or the results of capitalism where you have this like guy in a shitty mask robbing a fast food restaurant with like no ingenuity. And then you're taking that and you're putting it onto a canvas for the, uh, for the purpose of of like representing minimum wage as a, in a sense, I think there's like a nice network there of, of yeah. symbols and of, of different things pointing towards the same sort of issue. That's yeah. not, to say, that's not to take anything away from the, from the, like the more worked over ones, but even the ones that are more worked over, it's like you're using, you're using things like spray paint. This one, the, uh, the mark making looks kind of like graffiti. So it still sort of rests in this sort of like urban distressed or just like neglect kind of yeah. uh, symbology. Yeah, it's not, I don't treat any of these with very much respect. And, I, and I'm, yeah, I mean, like I'm not purposely representing, for example, like graffiti, but I am, like I have paint pens and I have like Cryolon spray paint and like I am frustrated. And so I do that. Yeah. And it looks like graffiti because like a lot of kids who grew up tagging were like people who felt alienated from like highbrow art. And so I mean also they're they were, alienated like, not kids in general, honestly. Yeah. They're alienated in general. Like that's why you're like fucking up private property and going out in the middle of the night and breaking the rules. Like I'm not intentionally in dialogue with that. I'm just that's where it's coming from. So it is looking that way. And yeah, and like like you're saying, like the network of symbology, like that's kind of the thing I want to explore with this too, in that some of them look very different than other ones. And so this exists as a singular body of work and within the body of work itself, there becomes a unified language. Yeah. And so they don't all have to look the same because they are all interconnected if you actually uh, filter through and sift through them. Totally. Um, so I guess I, another conversation that I wanted to have was like, I guess about actually let's i'm gonna i'm gonna hold off on that i wanted to <laughs> there's chip yeah yo what's up what's up with him you want to come in and join on this like thing chip uh, he's recording this you want to join my studio visit interview hello kevin what's up you can't hear me <laughs> I, heard that. I heard you i to say what's up you heard me i'm going to read Yo, what's up? Where you, where you going off to? Or you just come in? I'm about to go up on the roof. Oh, sick. I think we're going to have to cut this part. 
Hey, yo, uh, yo wait, yo, before yo, you before you, you go, go, before you go, check out what yo, I added yo. to to your studio. A little That's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gonna be like, what's that, Doug? That, that's the other guy that uses the space. <laughs> oh yeah, that's my character. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. Hell yeah, dude. Pig McCall. That's better than what I've been working on, so yeah. <laughs> What, just the pig or the... <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the pig is great. Maybe I'll just make a pig next. Or maybe I'll pig start is... making ham. Make, like, those, like, in those, like, I don't know if they're real or not, but those inflated pig ball testicles that were in those images that we... The pig balls? The pig balls, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll do a very nice, like, photorealist painting of the pig balls. You know, that'll be historic in the future. Historic. <laughs> okay, bye, Kevin. All right, Chip. So the thing that like strikes me out of all of these is the Christmas tree print painting. I'm sure that we've talked about this before. It's this interesting departure from from the rest of the imagery. And I know that you're kind of playing around with uh, images or pa- depictions of Christmas trees as well. Yeah, what's for a second? That's actually the first one, and I've been debating whether or not I even like show it because it's so different. It was like a experiment I don't, I don't know it kind of informed the rest but what happened was i was like oh shit like i don't want to do oil paintings on these yeah and the christmas tree was that and i was thinking a lot about christmas trees and like middle class religious holidays and the emptiness of christmas or at least that's my relationship to it and it looks very different it informed me it told me i don't want to do this i don't want to go this <laughs> direction i feel like you don't do it <laughs> Like, it didn't really work to me. Like, I didn't think that, I was like, oh, shit, like, that. I don't know if I like this. But it's there. I, can't, I still keep it in for some reason. I personally, like, I guess it's just, I don't know if it's just because now and I'm reading a lot about Tom's Kincaid, but, like. Oh, God, perfect. The symbology of the Christmas, especially, like, the artificial Christmas tree. It creates this other story or this other narrative. Because what you're showing is desperation in a lot of these, but the, um, the other side of desperation is kind of a hope. And I think like the pinnacle of capitalist hope is, besides like the lottery, is Christmas. Dude, that's perfect. That's a, yeah, you put that really well. Thank you. For me, Christmas is a perfect mix of desperation and hope. You, the way you're talking about other things, like your work and like Las Vegas, the aspirational, like to me, Christmas is deeply aspirational. Like, there's so many expectations put on it yeah. that um, it, it fails. It's like a self-defeating equation. It implodes in on itself because nothing can ever aspire to the expectation put on it. And yes. then therefore it becomes this glaring reminder of how much we don't have and how much we need because we've, we've projected everything onto the single day where we'll like have, what do we miss? We want family togetherness because we don't have that the rest of the year. Yeah. We want to feel bliss yeah. and joy we don't have that the rest of the year yeah. we want the singular object to be imbued with so much meaning that we feel renewed doesn't work and so yeah like i grew up but to be really honest like when i was a kid i would always ask my parents tell my parents like i don't want anything for christmas and they would be like what the hell are you talking about but for me it was like i couldn't handle the guilt and pressure that i felt to be grateful for something that i just I am such a cornball and nice kid. Like, I was just like, don't you believe I love you already? Like, you don't have to give me a gift to make me love you. That's how I felt about Christmas was that I was being bribed into loving them because they were worried they didn't do a good enough job as parents. And I felt this, like, deep pain for them. And so I just wanted to opt out. I was like, just like, it's a normal day. I love you. Like, I appreciate you. You don't have to buy me a toy. Like, please, just God, I can't handle this guilt. And like, wow. I hate Christmas. I also love it, but as a kid, I I felt weird about it. It has hard for me. My attraction is always to the the schmaltz of it. I love, uh, and that's and yeah, that's sure. typically my perspective on things. I guess it's more well, that's just a like very Reno thing too. What? It's like a very Reno thing. Like yeah. you knowing to even watch Thomas Kincaid and like that he's in Placerville and then like all the like <laughs> pitch that you're plugged into, dude, totally. That's cool. I know you do have a lot of like maybe like ironic dialogue with Thomas Kincaid. He is no different. Like what you just described, you just described the entire art world, like the entire bunch mm-hmm. of art world. These people 
are just honest about it. So you honest, he honestly believed that it was some part of his mission to, um, to spread the gospel through his paintings. So he like forged in a way this narrative that is kind of false about like, I have this honest love and I want to spread the gospel through my paintings and all of my people and all of my supporters don't care about the snobbish elite who have since like lost their idea of like what art world, what artwork, what art is supposed to be, which is like a, a message to the public, which is not true, of course. And he was going to bring it back to this like fake idea of what art is supposed to be. So he's a, he's a perfect Christian white Christian reactionary in America. Yeah. Like, he then that that by the way that behavior see you just you actually just to go full circle justified my whole series. Yeah. He speaking to oh, yeah. working class white people who feel left behind by coastal elites. They're alienated. Yeah. By capitalism. So he comes in, he has religion and this messianic narrative as an artist and he's going to save them and he's going to like get he you know I'm he's Glenn that's why I say he's Glenn Beck of the art world he's the yeah. Glenn Beck of the art world and the thing that I want to be certain of is to not talk about any sort of criticism of his work as artwork and to ins instead approach his work as just product as just an, oh, cool. uh, yeah just the merchandise of a corporation that's and a good idea that, and within that reading it's like that's totally okay like you know, people feel say that they feel happiness towards Kinkade, when they see Kincaid's work, and that this is uh, something that brings the, the the light of God into their house. You know, a very positive relationship with Kincaid's work. But at the same time, you could like, and uh, this is personally speaking, but I feel the same way like towards like Coca Cola, and it has that open happiness. And when you consume it, you feel that like the branding is more is possibly more important than the product. And the branding exactly. and the product like intertwine. The material aspect is irrelevant to the symbolic aspect. Yeah. Which is P capitalism. Yeah. Selling a bag of air in a sense. Oh yeah. Yeah. Do you and think like, that, I like that because hmm? do you think that these paintings somehow somewhat like kind of tie into them just because like I know that these are well like well made. And I know that you're you're treating them with like dignity, but do you think that there's something about them that like has that taps into uh, taps into the like the type of product that like you would find at like a bodega? It's like you act you have low access, low taste, that kind of stereotype about um, blue collar consumers. Do these pieces? Yeah, in a way. I mean, if you think about a bodega, you think about. I think about something that's incredibly disheveled, yeah. but in a human way, like if you think about um, Whole Foods, Whole Foods, the level of like aesthetic presentation is psychotically manufactured. Yeah. Um, which I find alienating. Whereas when I go to a bodega and the guy is like some guy from Yemen who doesn't speak English well, but he's really friendly and all of the signs like, the credit card minimum sign is on a torn piece of cardboard with Sharpie and he doesn't even spell <laughs> any of the words right. I'm just like, oh yeah, like a real human being is involved in this. So like, and in a way that's like a form of disregard. Like, you know, he's not like, I got to make this sign nice. He's like, fuck these idiots who come in and harass me. Like, here's your shitty sign. Yeah. I love that. So that, there's no, yeah, there's no like jazzing it up. What? There's no jazzing it up. No, it's totally honest. And that's why it looks shitty or what we would call shitty. I, I don't know, like to me, like imperfection and things that are rough around the edges or dirty or grim all scream a form of authenticity. Now, of course, authenticity is like a own subject that you can question. But for me, I, what? that's why I like New York, that's why I like bodegas because it just feels personal. It feels like real, it's not perfect. It's incredibly flawed and it's dirty. Like, I also realized, too, that, like, a lot of this work, specifically the fast food robbery stuff, and say, like, also the food or the, or the uh, casinos, came actually from, like, a deep sentimental romantic longing that, I, that was in me from my childhood experiences. Like, as much mm -hmm. as, like, I'm criticizing the reality that creates, like, say, a guy who robs an Arby's, <laughs> I also, like, really, really miss um, 
being in a really dirty, greasy round table where like the 16 year old cashier won't clean up the dining area and it's gross. And there's like 38 year olds running around with pizza and they're touching everything. Like I realized like as much as I'm like, these places are disgusting and absurd. I'm like, I also like love and miss them. And so, yeah, like I do have this like weird relationship to like, I guess like all this stuff kind of filters under kitchen in its own weird way. When you think of like fast casual and strip malls in the middle, you know, the suburbs and, yeah there's a lot of that like i'm not just criticizing it i'm also just kind of trying to come to terms with it i don't know i have very mixed feelings because i kind of love it and i kind of miss it sometimes especially lately like i'm like almost like don't feel at home in new york anymore but i'm like maybe i am just like some like middle class kind of white trash kid who <laughs> to live in ohio you know the casino is like the prime example which is we would go there everyone is fully engaged in the spectacle in the concept like you're saying like casino represents wealth i'm going to go here and i'm going to have a good time i'm going to make money i'm going to eat a lot of food like it's a constructed reality and to be a part of it you have to accept that that's true when you're 13 you don't get to engage on at that level and you just see it for what it is like yeah cigarettes there's really old people who are drunk and sad and the food's kind of gross and it's clearly just a place to steal working class people's money and it's a scam this thing that i'm told is good is a scam so it's your first like large uh wake up call to the fact that there are predators in the world right it's 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 happening on a large scale and the adults aren't questioning it so like for me, like I always felt like I felt alienated in a casino, at least of all, cause like I'm a kid and I can't like drink and like use the, I can't like play revenge. I do have to disagree about one point, which is the food. Um, okay, ate, the food can be good. I ate so much fucking filet mignon at one last time I went to Reno and like lobster That's tail. Awesome. <laughs> it's like yeah. where this photo was taken was a, uh, at the Atlantis, Atlantis or the Pepper Mill. You go, like my grandmother and my aunt go to two casinos. And last time I went there, it was my grandmother's birthday. I was there with my, with my mom, my sister, my aunt and my grandmother. So like within 24 hours, like tensions were riding high. Like it was already <laughs> like, we can't see it. Like. And you go to the buffet because everyone goes to the buffet as illustrated by how long the line tends to be, up to 100 people in line to go to the buffet, which is justified because the cuisine is pretty much top-notch. Because these are, sure. these are like the top shelf items. Like, well, Kevin, not- isn't it the perfect symbol of the, situ- the reality of like Reno and Las Vegas and Tahoe? It's like a polished turd in that like, we're going to enjoy filet mignon, but we're going to yeah. enjoy it in a fucking buffet setting yeah in a big line and we're gonna eat eight of them as fast as we can yeah it's like that kind of exactly the contradiction that i'm obsessed with and i feel like i've experienced my whole life which is like this nice good thing is ruined by our own idiocy i'm not gonna lie like i think poker is fucking fun yes but like the the war the, the culture of the casino and the spectacle of the casino and like what it does to the lives of the people around it and its relationship in American history. It's like fucked up. It's super fucked up. And there's, I can't intellectualize it any more than that. Like it's not good. It's a bad thing. Like, and during this like trip to Reno, I won like a thousand dollars. I won like a grand on slot machines. That's crazy. Which is insane. Like that's like, that's that you, you kind of, you walk away max with like 200 bucks and that's probably spending a hundred bucks on the machine anyway. And you have this weird thing in your head where you're like, man, what if I put that, what if I did that, what if I continued, what could I have had then, you know? It's like that temptation of something for nothing. It goes back to the aspirational. And it also goes back to to tie it back into like why we're here. It's like that ties into the fast food robbery, which is something from nothing or like not a lot, which is just like, how do I short circuit the system of capitalism, right? Like you winning a thousand bucks by pulling a slot machine is not too different than a guy being like, well, I got this shotgun and this screen mask. I'm going to the gas station. I'm (laughs) taking it all. And it is aspirational. Like that guy's aspiring to not be fucking broke. 
Yes. So are you. It's not too. It's not different. The casino and the robbery. That's actually an interesting like overlap between those two things. There is like an aspect of criminality of like, am I like short circuiting the system? Am I hacking the system? Compound that with the fact that most people don't have very much. Uh, most people are desperate, rightfully so. I have no judgment of people who feel desperate. Um, and what if you feel like your labor will never amount to anything and you can't escape and you feel trapped? Yeah. Then you're like, here's the casino. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster. I think there's something about the relationship between the content and your interventions with them. Because we're talking about that we're talking about these almost illustrating a certain low. But there's something about like, but I'm also like, wow, these are, some of these are like actually pretty. I'm curious about. Well, at the end of the day, like I'm still making aesthetic choices. I'm still someone who paints. I'm still an artist. And I also like the, like the built-in contradiction of the, the grimness of the reality and the beautifulness of the, the beauty of the image. And can I make an attractive image of something that is, I don't want to say it's unattractive itself, but is, is terrible. I like contradictions. Right. Life is full of contradictions. People are full of contradictions. So yeah, it's funny you point that out because yes, these, that is a contradictory element of these pieces that they kind of have an element of like aesthetic beauty, like in a classical sense, like that they're ordered and they're kind of nice to look at and they're a little attractive and they're a little bright. And a lot of them are very saturated, actually. There's a yes. lot of high saturation going on, which was purposeful because a lot of the image, the CCTV footage of, say, specifically the fast food robbery tend to be really desaturated. And so, like, combining those with a very uh, sometimes, like, minute or faint but high saturation moment, I thought created a lot of, like, push and pull in the image and it made you get sucked in. Um and I personally just like that about an image. Yeah, the one that you're pointing out, like the blue area too, like that's a guy robbing a place and that's, I didn't even rub the paper out. I actually just put polymer over the whole print. And so it's really faded and it's, and you can just see the cyan and the magenta from the printer ink. And then behind it is like yeah. industrial uh, enamel gold spray paint for like handrails. It's like the outdoor Krylon paint. Yeah. So it's like, really like industrial non-art material and then this terrible thing and yeah i i don't know i still wanted to make interesting images i like this idea of them like being really attractive and then because maybe people who like don't think about any of this stuff or don't if i explain you know i've explained this to people and they're just like yeah i don't this means nothing to me i don't get it or i don't agree with you like i'm a conservative i actually think these people are idiots yeah. you know and, like and like makes sense then they're then, but then like people who aren't thinking about it are still drawn. It's, it's an arresting image still. If you make like a um, tactful aesthetic choice. You also have these, like the, is that the one image? There's like a couple of images of me. Of the ones that you have pictures of, cause this isn't all of them. Yeah. Yeah. That's that one is the most clearly meat based image. What have I done? You know, like me is like, I'm always too like, and it relates to all this deeply interested in the commodification of a living being. You know, when something's, someone or something's body is reduced to an object or a product or just a mechanism for creating labor. Or creating oh, that's actually, labor. that's incredibly fascinating. I didn't realize that. Yeah, I, oh, I hate that. Amazing. I hate that that's a fact. I mean, that's. That's amazing. That, actually, like, that tie, wow, that's. I never realized that. That's that's incredible. That the person yeah, so that's the past the robbery meat. is related in a sense to the depiction of the meat. Because even in your larger paintings, I thought that there were I, I knew that there was like I thought it was like because you were showing it was mostly like pig products, like pork products. And not just like the not just like the pork belly, the 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 good shit from the pork from the belt from the pig, but yeah. like, like these are pig's feet. Yeah. So I thought it was just like a low product with like, with like these uh these uh, alienated images. I didn't realize that like there's a possible relationship between these two things. Yeah, I mean like in the grand arc of the things that I'm interested in that have been manifested in my art in the last four years. So yeah, the reason the meets there has to do with the commodification 
of bodies. And then the fast food robbery, you know, I don't know. I think that like in, in American media, when we look at an image of a person who's committing a crime, we think of them as invalid. And yeah. But I also, when I see someone who's working in retail or, fa- or, or food service, you know, like I'm seeing someone whose like total identity has been reduced to a, to a function under capitalism. And to me, that, that is a, an act of uh, complex violence. And so someone whose whole life is reduced to creating value for someone else or a company is no different than like a pig that's been chopped up and put in the grocery store. Right. And I think they're both acts of violence. And, you know, that's why people feel alienated because their full identity isn't able to manifest itself in a work environment because they're only asked to do a specific function and they're asked to repress their true selves. And people snap. I mean, that's like a trope almost is like the guy going crazy on the factory line, right? Like, and their only representation of self is through this. Like, the only thing that's like, the only thing that's like objectively valuable about them is their worth as a as a part of a um, a larger system. Like, yes, is, is is their specific labor. Yeah, I am interested in the violence that is systemic that causes this person to think that it was a good idea to do this in the first place. And I have like that's why not every image is just a fast food robbery. Right. Like that one on the left right there, that guy's not even doing anything. He's just there. It's from a fast food robbery. It's from an article. But like in that moment, he's not doing anything. The casino, there's no obvious act of violence. The the pig's feet, when we're in the store, we don't look at that and go, oh my God, industrial farming is so horribly violent. Right. Um, we don't look at Christmas trees and think, oh my God, there could be an aspect of something negative or violent behind Christmas. But like to me, there is an there's a current between all of these things. Like it's all there. And like, so if I can like catch you with the obvious one, I can pull you in. Maybe we can see the other ones that are not so obvious. Like, you know, Hannah Arendt's banality of evil type thinking. Right. Sometimes evil is incredibly boring. Yes. I don't think. Yeah. The banality of evil. Exactly. Exactly. Totally. Totally. You know, like a, like a, a fucking Jack in the box is a banal place. Yeah. But like there's a complex misery that you know is imbued in this in it and you can't ignore it if you have the right sensibility. To me that's a form of pilot. My friend's dad when we were eleven years old, he was a retired cop and he managed a jack in the box and he ate jack in the box every day and he had a heart attack and died. Like he was a cop, that's a violent institution, and then he became yeah. a manager of Jack in the Box and that's where he died. He died at the Jack in the Box. He didn't die as a cop. That's that's tra- that's so tragic. It's like, yeah, dude. It's 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 the thing. The thing that's meant to sustain you is also the impetus like, for your downfall. You. It's also the fuel yeah. for your downfall. Yeah. Um. What? Uh, what else did I yeah. have in mind? Um, I don't know, but that's you. I feel like. That's the perfect metaphor for this whole thing. You know, the cop who died at Jack in the Box from heart disease. Yeah. 